Well, thank you, Mr. Smith. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to those on the webcast. During Paul's first missionary journey, he visited the area of Lystra and Derby. This was around 48 AD, somewhere in there. And we read about this in Acts 14. Acts 14, and I'm gonna start in verse six. He's just from, uh, come from Iconium, which was persecuting him. And it says in verse six that they fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of La Laconia and to the surrounding region. They were preaching the gospel there. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, and Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet, and he leaped and walked. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lycaonian, Lycaonian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas, they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes, ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them. In verse 18, with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city. So for one, they're about to be sacrificed to his gods, and now there's stoned, and uh, dragged Paul out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up, went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. Then in verse 21, when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. It is impossible to say with any certainty, but I'm guessing there was a very special young man who witnessed these things, the healing, the persecution, preaching, and the stoning. Because Paul makes reference to this in a letter he wrote to this young man, perhaps 20 years later. And you find this reference in the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 3, verse 10. Where Paul says to Timothy, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecution, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. We don't know anything about Timothy beyond what glimpses Luke and Paul gave us, but today I would like to examine what they do reveal and see what we can learn through the life of Timothy. We know that he started learning about God very early in his life. If you stay here in 2 Timothy 3 and verse, go down to verse 15, You'll see that he says that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. 
If you go back to the first chapter, you find a little bit more about this early life. In 2 Timothy 1, verse 5, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This seems to be a reference to Timothy receiving the Holy Spirit through the laying on of Paul's hands. While there's no record of Paul encountering Timothy during his first missionary journey, his second journey <clears throat> was a game changer for both of them. But if Paul was present for Timothy's baptism, it could have been taken place on his first visit. Nevertheless, in Acts 16, we read what happens on the second visit. Acts 16 and verse 1, Paul says, returns to Derby and Lystra. He came there and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. Of course, we read earlier that that mother was Eunice. Uh, it says here that his father was, uh, was, was Greek and he was well spoken of by the brethren who are at Lystra and Iconium. Paul makes reference to this also in 1 Timothy in chap chapter 1, verse 18. I don't want you to turn there now. We'll go there later. But he says, This uh, charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. So they, people, people had good things to say about him. But here in verse 3, it's, it says uh, of uh, Acts 16, and Paul wanted to have him go on with him. He took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. Now this is a reference to the previous chapter, Acts 15, where some, ma some major decisions were made, including the fact the Gentiles were not required to be circumcised. So why did he circumcise Timothy? Well, it says, because his father was a Greek and Paul needed to be able to present him in the synagogues as, he, um, as a Jew, the synagogues he went to preach in. And he felt that it would be most expedient under the circumstances to have Timothy go through this experience. Now, Timothy accompanied Paul and his primary assistant, Silas, to Troas and on to Philippi. Although Silas is said to have been thrown into prison along with Paul, nothing is said about Timothy. Nevertheless, he is in their company as they continue to Thessalonica, then on to Berea. And in Acts 17, we see him specifically mentioned again in verse 13, Acts 17, 13. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. And then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea. But both Silas and Timothy remained there in Berea. This was, uh, turns out to be a not uncommon thing for Paul to send Timothy or have Timothy remain in a certain place in order to carry on the work that he was doing. In verse 15, so those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. So Paul and Silas joined Timothy in Athens, or joined Paul, Silas and Timothy joined Paul in Athens, and, uh, but it didn't take long before Paul changed his mind. In one of the first letters that Paul wrote, he had this to say about Timothy. This is the first Thessalonians chapter three. First Thessalonians chapter three. And he admits what happened to him when he was thinking about these things in Athens. It says, therefore, in verse, verse one of chapter three, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, 
our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. I'd like you to notice in verse 2 that Timothy is already being called a minister of God. How old Timothy was, we're not entirely sure. Um, the scriptures cover roughly 20 years of Timothy's life. And in the very later years, he's still called a young man. So the chances are that he was being ordained and, and uh, asked to accompany Paul, perhaps in his early 20s. And reference is made to his ordination in uh, 1 Timothy 4, verse 14. Once again, don't turn there right now. We'll go there later. Neglect not the gift that is in you, which was given to you by to by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery or with the, the elders. And so he, he seemed to have been ordained. We, we'd read earlier that the elders were in the area where Paul encountered him, and they may have even ordained him before, before he left. Then here, if we continue in 1 Thessalonians, let's go to verse uh, 4. Uh, he says to the Thessalonians, who told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened. And you know, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. So that's the reason why he sent Timothy up there. He needed to know how they were doing. He needed to be reassured that things were going well. And we're going to continue in this, uh, this book shortly. But I would like to refer to Acts 18, verse 4, when he's in Corinth. It says he reasoned in the synagogue every... He went to Corinth right after Athens. It says he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. And it says that when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. This is about 52 AD, and uh, he, it says here in the book of Acts that Silas and Paul returned then from Macedonia, Timothy's visit to Thessalonica, and went back to the, met Paul now in Corinth. The beginning of the book of Thessalonians that we're in now uh, specifically says that he's uh, sending greetings to them from Paul's uh, Silvanus or Silas and Timothy. So we know that he has returned. And if we continue now in verse 6 of 1 Thessalonians 3, he reflects on the Timothy's return. He says, Now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you, Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. So Paul, Timothy is, being, is acting as an emissary, not only to the Thessalonians, but to Paul as well, to reassure him that things are going well in Thessalonica. Paul writes a second letter to the Thessalonians, and he includes Timothy in the greetings. So we know that he is con continuing to be uh, with Paul in Corinth. And after a year and a half, Paul goes to Ephesus from Corinth and then on to Jerusalem. We don't know if Timothy went to Jerusalem, but on his third journey, we know Paul returns to Ephesus where he writes a corrective letter to Corinth. And we know Timothy is with him in Ephesus. In 1 Corinthians 4, we read in this letter, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 14, 1 Corinthians 4.14, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. As I said, we should probably be following these instructions that Paul is giving to the church as he writes to and to Timothy later on. In verse 17 it says, For this reason, 
I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. So once again, Timothy is being sent as an emissary this time to Corinth to carry out the, the, the needs he has. He may have even carried the letter with him. In the last uh, chapter of this book, in 1 Corinthians 16, 5, he, Paul gives some of his plans. He says, Now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia, and it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not wish to see you now on my way, but I hope to stay with you stay a while with you if the Lord permits. But I'll tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So he's telling him about what's happening in Ephesus. But then in verse 10, he says, Now if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord as I also do. Therefore, let no one despise him, and we'll read about that later, uh, referring to the fact that he is a, uh, a youth and he wa wants them to uh, hold them in fairly high esteem because of the work that he's doing. But send him on his journey in peace that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. So he's acting once again as an emissary. In Acts 19, in verse 21, we read of Paul's visit to Ephesus, and he says that uh, when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit, uh, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, so he's still making plans, and saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome, which he was able to fulfill, but not on on his own power, unfortunately. Then in verse 22, in anticipation of his trip to Macedonia, he sends two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time, which results in the riot at over Diana. And in verse chapter 20, after the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now in Macedonia, he writes a follow-up letter to the Corinthians. And in there he refers, in the book of 2 Corinthians, he refers to the fact that Timothy is now with him and is sending them greetings along with himself. Then in verse 15 of 2 Corinthians 1, it says, and in this confidence, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit to pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. And what he's having to do here is defend himself a little bit because he had told them at some point that he was going to come see them, then he was going to go to Macedonia, he was going to come back and see them. Well, he didn't do that. And they took, they, they were very, very sensitive and they, they were very offended by his change of plans. And so he, you know, he says in verse, seven, chapter, verse 17 here, he says, therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, I, do I plan according to the flesh that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no? And he continues on. Let's, let's go to verse 19. It says, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy, so Timothy was acting as a preacher even then, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. Now in Acts 20 and verse 2, go back there, we find that when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. So he finally did go down to Corinth stayed there three months, at which time he wrote the letter to the Romans. And in that letter to the Romans, he does send them greetings uh, in Romans 16, 21. It says, Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, 
Jason and Sosipater, my countrymen, greet you. And then continuing in verse 3 of Acts 20, he says, And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sosipater, or Sopater of Berea, accompanied him to Asia. Also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derbe and Timothy. And Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. So he had quite an entourage that he was going to uh, take with him to Jerusalem. But he sent most of these men, as it says in verse 5, ahead, waiting for us at Troas. He himself went up to Philippi, and in verse 6, he sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them in Troas, where we stayed seven days. He picked up Timothy and, and, uh, and the others. They went with Paul to Jerusalem. Um, Timothy probably went with him to Rome as well, along with Luke. And the reason I say that is that when he got to Rome, he wrote several letters, one to the Colossians, and where, where he includes Timothy as one of the uh, people greeting them, and another letter to Philemon, one of the uh, elders in Colossae, and again sends greetings from Timothy. At the end of his imprisonment, he writes another letter to Philippi near, near the end, and again he says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So it would sort of appear that uh, Timothy spent quite a bit of time with Paul in Rome, tending to his needs. But I'd like to go to Philippi Philippians 2. Just uh, quoted Philippians 1 a moment ago where he sends greetings. Whether Timothy was actually imprisoned or not is, uh, is unknown, but he was certainly there with Paul. And in Philippians 2 and verse 19, he has this, this message to the Philippians regarding Timothy. It gives some insight into him. Philippians 2, 19, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. Again, he wants to use him as an emissary. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father he served with me in the gospel. Therefore I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. There's one other reference in the, uh, in the epistles. This one in Hebrews 13. Verse 23, where he says, No, our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. I don't know for sure who he was writing to, other than the Hebrews. I don't know for sure that it was Paul. I personally think it was. Why else would he have talked about his imprisonment in Timothy? But in any case, in this particular situation, Timothy has been set free. After his release, Paul then writes two letters to Timothy where we get the majority of our insight into what he had to say about Timothy. So if you turn with me now to 1 Timothy, we're going to read excerpts from what he wrote to this young man that he had trained and who had traveled with him and spent so much time acting as his uh, emissary and ambassador to the various churches that he was Paul was uh, attending to. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 1, we read, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope, to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul always asks, for grace and peace in his letters. If you read the salutations, you find a couple, couple of things. Number one, he, address, he addresses the Father and the Son, leaves the Holy Spirit out, which is one reason why we know that the Holy Spirit doesn't seem to be a person in this case. But he also asks for grace and peace, except in the, two, the three letters that are pastoral letters, to Timothy and Titus. In those, he adds mercy, grace, mercy, and peace. 
Why? I don't know. <laughs> but I kind of wonder if it doesn't have to do with the fact that he, he feels as a minister himself that ministers need a certain amount of mercy from God. And he's imploring God for that. He even addresses that fact in verse 13 and 16, how God was merciful to him in putting him into the ministry and rescuing him from the persecution of the church that he was engaged in. Then in verse 3, he says to Timothy, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Paul seems to have been reluctant to, to not go with Paul, but he's persuaded to stay in Ephesus, which is, you know, in this case, he wasn't being sent. He was being asked to stay. But uh, you, Paul needed him to straighten out some things that were beginning to affect the church, which is the primary reason for this letter. This included some wanting to change doctrine, giving heed to fables, endless genealogies, conspiracy theories, old wives' tales, and striving over words, a theme repeated several times in his letter. It's a caution we would do well to heed ourselves, to not fall into this trap of he heeding fables and, and other stories. In verse 18, we read this earlier, it says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. This analogy of our Christian life as a warfare against the external influences against us pervades Paul's letters as well, especially this one to Timothy. So keep that in mind also as we go through the letter. In chapter 2, Paul exhorts through Timothy that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So Paul's desire in them praying for the leaders and for the kings where the day would be able to have a peaceful life. But he also mentions godliness and honesty. Godliness is referred to 10 times in his letters to Timothy. This idea of godliness and purity is another theme and aspect of our Christian life that we would do well to be reminded of. And in verse eight, he says, I will therefore I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. He follows this up with his instructions regarding the women of the congregation, that in chapter 3 addresses the qualifications for elders and deacons. And then in verse 14, he says, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. So he was hoping to return to, to uh, Timothy to see him again there in Ephesus. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Then in chapter 4, Paul talks again of false doctrine. And then in verse 6, he says, If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. And then he, continuing on some of the themes that we've already seen, he says, But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that, is, that now is and of that which is to come. In verse 11, he says, These things command and teach. And then he says in verse 12, Let no one despise your youth. This is probably 15 years after Paul had, been, or Paul had encountered him in, in uh, Lystra. And uh, he's still here called a youth. I'm guessing he might be around 35 now. 
but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to, re atten attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership, referring to his ministry. Meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Once again, stay steadfast to the doctrines that I have taught you. Then in the next chapter, verse one, referring to the fact that he is a youth, still a young man, says, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, with all purity. Then he talks about uh, honoring widows. I won't go into that. But in uh, verse 21, he says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect elders that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily. In other words, don't ordain a minister hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. So once again, the idea of purity. Then he says, no longer drink wa only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. So we get another glimpse into Timothy's state. He apparently had some frequent infirmities that Paul thought wine would assist with. In the last chapter of, the, of this book, we'll start in verse 10. He says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And he says in verse 11, but you, O man of God, referring to Timothy in a very affectionate way and uh, sort of a instruction in itself, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith. Again, this idea of warfare, lay hold on eternal life to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing. So he's constantly re reiterating to Timothy that he needs to be following God's way carefully and doing it without, without sinning. Instructions that we too should be heeding. Then in verse 20, he says, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge by professing it some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you, amen. So he concludes the letter by saying, don't follow those fables that you people are trying to tell you. Within a few years, Paul was again imprisoned for the last time. And he wrote his final letter to Timothy and to us. And so in the beginning of this last letter, says, Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which, in, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son. He's, th throughout his, uh, his ministry, he's, he considers Timothy to be this beloved son. It's very personal and very, very... Uh, Oh, humbling, you might say. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. And of course, he's not sure that he's ever going to be able to get out of prison this time. In chapter 2, he says, Therefore, my son... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 
So he wants him to be instructing other men to, to be able to take over. Then back to his theme of uh, a warfare, it says, You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And verse 7, consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. And finally, in chapter 4, he gives his final instructions to, to Timothy. He says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. That same theme that we've re constantly re returned to. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Then in verse 9, says, be diligent to come to me quickly. So he wants to see him again before something happens to him. So for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. Cretans for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. So he wants, uh, wants Mark to come. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus, Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus of Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. And many think that this may be a reference to him helping to canonize the New Testament before his death. Then finally, in verse, chapter, or verse 19, he says, Greet Prissa and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with you, with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. So after this tender letter, he says goodbye to Timothy. I can't be certain whether uh, Timothy came, but I'm guessing that he did bring the books and saw Paul before he, uh, he was killed. Timothy, above all of his other companions in his ministry, remained a great friend and servant to the Apostle Paul. It was a life filled with service, although we only get glimpses of his younger days. But the example he set and the instructions he received from Paul, including his warnings against fables and false doctrine, fighting the good fight and remaining pure in our relationships with God and our fellow man, can be of great benefit to us as we too await the coming of our Lord and Savior.